Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be introducing parametric technology and sharing examples of how the A&E industry and BHDP are leveraging it as part of an integrated process to deliver optimized planning and design solutions. Before we get started and by way of introduction, I'm Michael Verdeer and I lead the integrated industrial design market at BHDP where we serve clients that have manufacturing, warehousing, and material distribution facilities. I'm joined by Lestavian Beverly, who will be doing most of the heavy lifting today. Uh, Lestavian joined BHTP about three years ago after graduating from Louisiana Tech with a master's in architecture. One of the unique skills Lestavian acquired while in grad school was parametrics, and we feel very fortunate to have him as part of our firm where we can now take full advantage of this technology. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lestavian. Lestavian? Thanks for that introduction, Michael. Uh, everyone, I've got some pretty exciting things to share with you today, but before we get into that, I want to make sure you know about all the little icons on your screen. The important ones to take note of are the speaker bios that has um, ways for you to contact Michael and I, as well as the LinkedIn page, which will take you to BHDP's LinkedIn account, as well as the uh, Q&A button, which you can use to submit questions, and finally, you can use the, um, the web link to take you to BHTP's account. So, now that's out of the way, let's get to the real reason we're here. Now, what I want to share with you is how parametric design increases the speed, efficiency, and overall productivity in my day-to-day -day work designing facilities, manufacturing plants, um, workplaces and so on. So for those of you, of you who are unfamiliar with it, it's essentially a way by which you can define the variables of pretty much any problem and use computer software to generate solutions for the problems and its applications are limitless. Now I know this because I've been working with the software for about five years now. It's something I picked up in college, I saw the potential in it and I made a personal effort to increase my expertise in it. Now I preach the advantages of this in my office and I have found many ways to utilize it, from designing elevations to numbering doors for a construction document package. Now, what makes this possible is the software. What I use are Grasshopper, which is a plug-in for 3D modeling software such as Rhinoceros, as well as Dynamo, which is a plug-in for Revit. Now, what the software does is, is it unlocks a visual scripting interface, which allows you to access some of the more advanced processes under the hood of Rhino and Revit. And these are normally only available to those with a more advanced knowledge of scripting languages. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this with, with three examples. The first is a corporate project. The, the next is an industrial project. And finally, I want to show you an art piece. Now, the the first example is for a project we did in Panama. A few years ago, we developed a master plan for a 110 hectare site called Metro Park. Now, the first phase is currently under construction. However, one of the clients wanted a more signature look for his facade. So the designer on the team came to me with a sketch and asked if I could help develop some options due to the short turnaround which was going to be required. So. I asked him what the objective was. What he wanted to do was update the current design while still maintaining the same grid spacing, mullion spacing, window sill, and head heights, which had already been designed. He also wanted to be more conscious of the ratio of glazed facade to opaque material due to some of the limitations in the ASHRAE guideline. Now, we achieved this by inserting metal panels into the existing mullion frames to generate different patterns. Now, one of the, uh, one of the challenges with this was to actually determining those parameters. The most obvious is the ratio of glaze to opaque materials, but what a lot of people worry about is how to actually maintain control of the design without getting caught in the weeds of what seems like an infinite number of possible solutions. So in order to combat that, we impose other restrictions as well. We limited the number of metal panel sizes to three, and that makes it less expensive to fabricate we, and also um, more easy, easy to kind of reproduce. We developed the logic behind the patterns, and that's as simple as 
defining that a pattern could alternate between three panel sizes or that you could use larger panels on the ends of an elevation and smaller panels in the middle. Now doing this, we made over 40 options in the course of three days and simultaneously calculated the grazing, glazing ratio, which would be used to evaluate the design. We compressed what could have taken weeks to develop the same number of options into days. Now, I'd like to show you how fast it is to make changes by showing you a quick software demonstration. Now what you see on the screen are rhino to the left, grasshopper to the right. <clears throat> and rhino we have cache files which reference um, the up the side we're going to be updating. And what you see in grasshopper is the uh, definition or rather the sequence of commands which would generate the design based on our constraint. Now for this, let's focus on this south facade. It has multiple components to it. There's the spandrel glass, which is occur, occurs between the floors and is typically opaque. Then there's the vision glass or the clear glass, which lets light but also heat pass through and that leads to heat gain. And what we want to do, use these existing panels of vision glass and insert metal panels into that module. This will create patterns the patterns we want, as well as decrease the amount of vision glass, which will in turn reduce our heat gain. Now we control this metal panels in Grasshopper. These control the width. This controls the different pattern types. Um, here we can actually kind of change which side of the glass that the metal panels um, occur in. So let's mess around with the sizes. But first, I need to turn on the graphics for now you can see. <clears throat> so take note of the glazing ratios. Currently it's at 36%. That will update dynamically as we change the design. So the pattern that you currently see has 30 inch panels on the corners and as it moves away from the corners it decreases to 18 panels. So let's say we found out the manufacturer doesn't actually make 30 inch, but they do make 36. Now we can change that by simply um, changing that 30 to a 36. Now before I press enter, I need to warn you, don't look at Grasshopper, look at Rhino. Actually look at the corners of the facade where I'm pointing now, otherwise you're gonna miss it. All right. So if you didn't catch that, I'm going to give you another shot because we just found out that the manufacturer discontinued 36 inch, so we got to move up to 48. Now that should have been, a, that's, you should see that is, yeah, that's a bit easier to notice there. Now, but what you should also notice is that the glazing calculation changed from 36 to 34. Now, I personally don't like the way this looks, so I, I think that the change in the size is, is a bit too abrupt. So let's um, remedy that by changing the 24 inch panels to 30 inch. You'll see it update in real time. Now let's change how much area the larger pieces cover. And you do that with this slider. So just type in a different number, update. <clears throat> now we're not really done yet because the client doesn't like the gradient look. So let's try something a little different. If I click, <clears throat> if I click um, the arrow, arrow in under pattern type, you're going to notice that it brings down a drop down menu. So let's use the ascending sizes option. Now you see we have a completely different pattern. It starts from the left within 18 inch panel moves to that 30 inch panel and ends at that 48 inch. Now, maybe the client thinks that this is just going to cost way too much. Well, we built in another pattern. So we can just do one size. Now we can actually um, also select from that list that we developed which panel size we want to change. So now we just bump it up to the 38 inch. 
Now, this is just one facade that we have that we control, but we can control each facade individually. Even as you see here, we can actually um, control different portions of the facade differently. As you see, the top is different from the first floor. Now, in terms of time, this took a little over half a day to develop. Now, as we worked with it to develop other options, the script evolved for the process. <clears throat> now, the key is knowing how to build the script in a way that not only accomplishes the task, but also anticipates the, the amount of control you're going to need. Now, with this script, we were able to develop the final option, which allows enough control and adaptability for us to generate a design that starts in the middle of the south facade, gets larger panels at the corners, continues that same size around the east and west facades, and finally shrinks again on the north facade. Now, with all, with all, it did all this while dynamically calculating the glazing area as we made changes. Now, I believe a missed opportunity on this project was testing the actual performance of the design options. Now, during the time that we were doing this, we didn't have the capability, but now we can use uh, Sapphire, which allows us to test the thermal performance, energy cons consumption, and daylighting for each, each option. Now, we can do things like change the type of glass, evaluate what effects that has on the performance, or we could look at the effects of shades or a breeze or lay, and since the fire is cloud-based, it can do all of these calculations way faster than our um, regular uh, computers. Now, this is just one example of how parametrics um, allowed us to accomplish in days what would have previously taken weeks. Yeah, thank you, Lestavian. I think one of the other things um, uh, from an executional standpoint where there are benefits to parametrics is during the review process, in a traditional approach, we would have created options uh, by hand, uh, come to a design review where it would have taken time to get uh, participants that needed to be there in the same room, and then presented the options. I've, typically, there would be one or two that they would have gravitated to. There might have needed to be some, some modifications made to it. So we would have had to go back, make those modifications by hand, and then arrange to have everyone back in the room, say, a week or two later, and we know how uh, people's schedules are, are quite full. One of the great things that Parametrics offers is our ability to make those changes live during a, a design review uh, to evaluate the look, the feel, the aesthetic, but also the percent glazing. Um, and one of the things that isn't included here, but you'll see in the next example, is we could have attached pricing uh, to the different panels, panel sizes, and would have given you some budgetary number associated with each option as well. And uh, so I just think there's lots of benefits with parametrics. Um, the visualization is great. The instant uh, evaluation is great. And then being able to link it to pricing or budgetary numbers during a single design review are just tremendous. So huge schedule savings. Um, and uh, so... I think enough said there. I'll turn it over, back over to you, Stephen, to talk about the next example. Thanks, Michael. So going on to the next one. In this example, I want to share a study we performed to see how far we could push it. It's way more complicated than the elevation example, and therefore it took a bit more time to develop. But essentially the objective of the study was to find an optimal warehouse layout for multiple types of stores and multiple types of materials. Each of these has a different utilization rate. Now, we also we're going to do all this while also reducing the footprint of the warehouse, which would in turn reduce construction costs. Now, this is a complicated problem, but the parameters were pretty obvious. We, if we have the building's parameters, like column spacing, number of bays, but we also have the criteria for laying out the storage racks for materials, such as the dimensions of the different rack types, how high they can be stacked, aisle widths for forklift trucks, and the distance from each pallet position to an overhead door position. Now that distance is important because we wanted to be sure that the materials with higher utilization rates are closer to the doors, which would lead, which would, uh, that were closer to the doors that lead to the production line. Now the challenge when dealing with optimization is how to define success, or rather how to um, boil it down to a numeric value that a computer can evaluate. 
Now, if the problem was simply to fit materials into the smallest building, all we have to do is just decrease the size of the building while making sure all those materials fit. But we've added the additional constraint of placing materials in order of travel distance based on the utilization rate. Now, what we had to do was express that relationship between the area and the travel distance as a single number. I won't get into the specific formula, but essentially we, we made a, a ratio rate weighted towards reducing the building size. Now, in other words, it optimizes the storage layout as well as the building size, but in this example, size was deemed more important. Now, after setting up all those parameters, defining the success criteria, I was able to let the computer software run through thousands of options while I was out at lunch eating burritos. Now, after that, all I had to do was um, um, look through the options that the computer previously evaluated and, and get the one that was the uh, best fit due to the fact that it creates thousands of options. So in the end, the computer did most of the work, but I had the final say in what was the appropriate design. And that, that design is based on all of the criteria that um, we set forth. So, so I think before Lestavian uh, demonstrates this in action, one of the things you're going to see is if you're working in a warehouse, they're really quite complicated facilities. It's not just a warehouse structure. The materials that are in there, they could be raw materials, packed materials, could be finished product. Each of them have a different storage methodology or restraint. Um, some need to go into uh, pallets uh, or racks, I'm sorry. Maybe they're four high racks, uh, uh, four deep. Uh, sometimes they are, can go uh, uh, floor storage, and they have different protocols on the storage methodology. So maybe it is uh, they can be stacked four high uh, or two high only. And so what you're going to see here is all those kind of constraints built into the parametrics, but the, the, the model that, that Lestavian has set up optimizes the way that those are arranged in the warehouse for space, but also to minimize travel uh, distances and uh, travel frequency into the operational side of the facility. All right. David, David. We'll get into the demonstration. The setup is the same as before. Rhino to the right and grasshopper, well, grasshopper to the right, rhino to the left. Now, what you see here is a sample warehouse layout. There are different colors for various material types. You, should, you see at the bottom here we have uh, staging labeled. Then we have uh, this X at the top. That's where the overhead door is. And then under that, you'll see the word valid. And that's just a way for me to quickly see that all the materials fit into our house. This right here. So moving on over to Grasshopper, I want to show you all these different parameters. We have column spacing. <clears throat> we have these uh, east and west column spacing, the actual dimensions of those columns. We have the number of bays in the east and west direction, as well as north and south, the number of bays you staging as well. And I'm going to scroll down here so that you can see the different parameters for the different types of racks. Now, in this instance, we have drive-in racks, we have collective racks, as well as row storage. And in each of these, there are different parameters which defines how large these racks are and how they're laid out. So, for instance, we're going to look at the drive-in racks and actually change the depth of racks from five to three just to see what happens. Now as you probably figured, the racks have gotten narrow, which compacts the layout, but let's change that from three to say seven. You're gonna notice that everything got a bit wider and less efficient. 
So let's change this back to five. Again, you notice that it changes five. Now, since there's so much extra space in this area, let's try to shrink the building. We're going to go from four bays east to west down to just to see what happens. Click that button, look over to the left to actually see the changes. Now you'll see that the button, the building is much more com compact and efficient and it dynamically reworks how each storage type gets laid out and made based on that forklift truck aisle distance. We now if we drop that distance down from 4.2, 2 meters, you're going to notice another pretty drastic change. Now it's even more compact, but I doubt anybody would enjoy driving in two meters of space. So let's just change that back to 4.2. Yeah, that way we can kind of have another a basis of which to evaluate everything else on that we change. Notice right there in real time, it updates. Now we can also make rough estimates on the probable cost of the building shell in order to make relative comparisons for the different options. We could simply assign a square footage cost and calculate that way, or we could look at the number of columns and calculate the area of the perimeter surface and so on to assign dollar values to calculate them. And we can do it in multiple units, multiple currencies. It's all essentially just mathematics that we build into the script. I'd like to show you how it optimizes as well. Now what it uses is an evolutionary solver. Essentially what it, this does is it mimics natural selection. It randomly creates a lot of options and then it evaluates those options based on the equation that we developed to determine its fitness. Now those that are more fit are then combined into other options and the process repeats until the solver realizes that the fitness just isn't going to get any better than this. So what you'll notice is that at first the changes are really drastic, but as it goes forward, it refines those parameter values to the point that it's only making minute changes. Then we just pluck out the solutions that we find appropriate. And, and those solutions are those that the software um, found fit based on that equation. Now we can further evaluate these options by performing more detailed simulations of the layout of the layouts selected and then update the script based on those results to refine our outcome. So you can see our different modeling simulation videos to see how that can be done. So software with parametric capabilities built in allows us to let the computer perform all this number crunching and frees us up to perform other tasks. It helps refine designs by automatically creating and evaluating options based on criteria that we define. And I believe that's the key to this. We define what success is, and we just let the computer do all the hard work to get there since it's faster and more efficient. Yeah, I think, thanks. Thank you, Stephen, for that demonstration. I think you could see the power of parametrics in this case. Uh, if you're evaluating a warehouse, whether it's an existing uh, facility or you're planning new, from that strategic planning phase of a project, I mean, it's just extremely powerful to ensure you're optimizing the space. We also know that throughout a project, some of the design criteria will change. Uh, in a warehouse space, the aisle width might change, the staging area width might change. They may, your client may introduce new, new materials that have to be stored. Maybe the, the storage methodology changes during the course of the front end of the project. And this tool is, uh, lends itself to being able to respond to those changes very rapidly. I mean, once Lestavian programs uh, uh, the, the, the visual scripting, it's quite easy, as he demonstrated, to make those changes immediately and do those during design reviews as well. And I think, uh, as he just demonstrated in this case, you can assign unit rates to building elements. Uh, we could have assigned unit rates to racking types, so drive-in racks, drive-through racks, push-back racks, selective racks, and based on the optimization that Parametrics uh, feeds back to us, 
you also get that, that budgetary number. So I think very powerful in the early planning stages allows a, a team to converge quickly on those optimal solutions that you can then carry off into detailed design. So Thank let's you. take us into that, your final example there, Lestavian. All right, thanks. This last example I'm gonna share with you is my personal favorite. It's an art piece we proposed for Toyota in one of their lobbies and I think it's real slick. We actually submitted it for a design award at the Revit Technology Conference. So needless to say, I'm really proud of it. Now, this came about because one of the spaces that we designed is this double height lobby space and behind the reception desk, well, we wanted to have something that speaks to Toyota, to, oh, excuse me, to Toyota and what they do. So what we proposed was a double height sculpture wall composed of different parts from cars that they've manufactured throughout their company's history. Now at first glance, this doesn't seem like a problem. They can have numeric parameters assigned to it. But as I said before, the applications of parametric design are limitless. Now the parameters can be defined as follows. We have the parts themselves, and then we have the X, Y, Z location of the parts on the wall. Then we have each part's angle of rotation. Now we didn't want this to look like a purely random assortment of parts, so we actually added some additional restrictions. We limited the angles of rotation to 90 degree increments so that we can impose some order onto its appearance. We also want to put the larger, heavier parts towards the bottom and have the lighter parts towards the top. This would limit how much steel would be required to support these heavier items. Now to illustrate this further, I want to show you a quick video we produced for the reward submission. Now we'll so what we did was we grabbed a few 3D models of Toyota vehicles from the internet. <clears throat> and then we took the pieces and parts of the models that we would want to use in the sculpture and extract them from those larger models. Now, over here inside of Grasshopper, and you can actually see that this thing gets modeled in three dimensions. And here we can control how many parts we want to use in this, which could in turn affect the cost. And then as I pan over, you're going to see that we can determine how high up the wall the larger parts will go. And we can also then determine what percentage of the whole each part of this. Now here you can see that eventually that the mufflers became pretty much 100% of the entire sculpture. And then here we can actually randomize that rotation of each element in, by, in those 90 degree increments that we established previously. Here is the final image of the sculpture that we produce. It's all in 3D, so we, we can just import into a 3D modeling software. Now here we have a walkthrough that we produced so that we can better illustrate how the uh, sculpture would feel within the space. What you just saw was the first floor, now we're up on the second floor, and the idea is that there's going to be a big skylight over, pouring light on top of it. So again, kind of uh, more fleshed out. We have that sculpture with all the lights pouring down on it to highlight it. And again, on the second floor, you kind of get a better feel for the space. And here's the final image that we use to try to convey that concept. So as you can see from these examples that I've shown, there are limitless possibilities for the applications in which parametric design can be used. So just in this short amount of time, I've shown you how we designed a facade, laid out a warehouse, and designed a sculpture. We were able to do this and create a great number of options and do it efficiently and see the effects of these changes made in real time using visual scripting interfaces like Grasshopper and Dynamo. Now we're able to do what normally takes weeks and days because of this. Now if you'd like to learn more, 
Again, you can click on my um, bio on the on the widget screen. It has my email information, LinkedIn account. Um, if now, if there are any, we're pretty much at the end of the presentation. If there are, are any questions, use the Q and A to submit them. So, the statement while while you were talking, we did get a couple of questions, and uh, we've got one here from David, uh, who asks, "How long does it normally take to develop one of these scripts?" Um, it depends on the complexity, but typically, it'll take. Um, four hours to a day to develop the initial script that we can actually get working. And then, as I said before, um, after that, the, the script normally evolves with the process. So it gets it starts out pretty simple, and then it gets more complex as we go, as we discover more functionality that we want to build into it. And then the idea is if we have a similar application or a similar problem, we can rehash, adapt that script, which in turn decreases the amount of uh, prep time we need. Okay. We've got a question here from uh, Megan. Megan asks, you've shown a lot of Grasshopper, but you mentioned a Revit plugin as well. What do you see it for, uh, what do you use it for, and how does it integrate with BIM? So the powerful thing about Revit and BIM is that the fact that you have data kind of embedded into these different um, components. So what we can do is we can manipulate that data kind of in batch. So for instance, I've written scripts that will renumber all the doors in a draw in drawings for a CD set and it'll it'll do all of that in in mass in, in one shot. That way you don't have somebody kind of going through a door schedule, spending a day doing that when we can really we have a computer which can do all of that type of front work. And I've also done things with it such as you know, some of our more sophisticated clients have um, systems in which they can they, they track where people are sitting, what um, what office or who's in what office, what department that person is in, and who sits at what workstation, what um, department that person is in. And they have developed these large Excel files. And what we're able to do is translate that data from those Excel files into Revit and kind of build that data into each workstation or room and then develop, develop different like color plans to help them illustrate better of how their spaces work. That's, that's, that, those are a few ways that I've used it. Okay, great. So we got one more question here uh, from Gregory. Gregory asks, uh, what are the applications for using this parametric tool on manufacturing processes, for instance, in design where you're trying to identify uh, optimal or low capital investment uh, solutions? So yeah, I'll go ahead and try to answer that one, um, Gregory, is I think just like the example the Stadium show on the warehouse. Uh, we can use parametrics not just in greenfield facility planning, but if there's an existing facility that, say, a client has acquired or maybe they want to repurpose a space, obviously that building or structure is there and we want to optimize the layout. So, you know, the Stadium can do the visual scripting to define all the parameters of that existing building and then do that optimization for the layout of uh, uh, product racks, rack types, circulation aisles, staging areas. I think some other ways that you might be able to use that is uh, in office planning or design. Um, again, whether it's greenfield or existing space, you know, workstation programming, uh, each of the clients we work with typically have different workstation standards in terms of size, the spacing between the workstations, some of the, uh, I'll call the uh, other elements that they want in an office environment, so it might be side tables, might be lateral files. Um, those type of things can be can be planned into there, and then you know, based on a, a an existing footprint of a building, um, you define those aisleways. You let the parametrics run through and give you the optimal layouts in order to get, say, maybe the the most people or most seating in a space. 
And I think that's another way. Um, you know, as, as Lestadian just showed this sculpture, that was something that we never thought that we'd ever use parametrics for. An opportunity presented itself, and uh, it was just a unique way to use parametrics. Some of the other things I can think of just off the top of my head are uh, planning uh, surface parking lots or parking garages. Again, whether it's greenfield or existing, how can you optimize those? So, again, as Lestadian said in the, in the presentation, we really think you know, the possibilities, we think we're just scratching the surface, quite honestly, on how we can apply parametrics in our design process, particularly the front-end planning. Um, and we really do. We think the opportunities are limitless. And uh, we look forward to um, working with other clients that have challenges uh, where we can leverage parametrics and then continue to come back and share how we've used that to really compress schedule, get that instant result in design reviews, uh, really compressing the overall execution period of a, of, a, of a project. And really, I think it's really bringing data to that front-end planning uh, phase of a project as well. So I think in closing, we'd just like to thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any other questions or interest in parametrics, um, certainly feel free to reach out to Lestavian or myself. The bios uh, were on the, the widget screen there. So we thank you again and uh, wish you all a good day. Thank you.